going to introduce um, the first of our speakers, which is uh, Roberto Serralde. Roberto is with um, Basham, Ringe, and Korea in Mexico. And um, Roberto, I'm going to turn it over to you and tell us how things are going in Mexico and the legal environment and, um, and what we might uh, be interested in hearing. Perfect. Thanks, Larry. And uh, everyone, thanks everyone for having me. So um, the way that I drafted this uh, this talk, it's just to oversee some of the top legal issues that we do have currently in in our country. Some of the key threats that might be facing our firms and also our uh, clients. The key opportunities that we are seeing for the future and how can we take opportunity of those to render services or to advise clients. And finally, it's how do we see the future of trade and foreign investment in the country. So those would be the, the topics that I would like to discuss with you all today. So the first uh, thing in, in the agenda for me, of course, it's the entry into force of the USMCA. The USMCA, as you're aware, entering into force on July the 1st. Right now, a lot of companies, they are kind of struggling on whether they do have the internal controls uh, to keep their operations if they did their prior work uh, uh, before the, uh, the, the agreement entering into force. Also, right now, they are dealing with some issues because not, uh, not all of their suppliers provide them uh, certificates of origin or certifications of origin because right now it's, it's a different thing in, in the agreement. So uh, it has been a, a busy week or, or, or the last two weeks for us in, in Mexico, in the U.S. and Canada, of course, because... Uh, we left everything for the last minute. The CDP in the U.S. published their interim guidelines in Mexico. Everything was published on uh, on the last week. There were a lot of uh, legislative changes that need to take place prior of the entry into force of the USMCA. And the Senate and the Deputy Chamber just uh, have their sessions on the on Monday and Tuesday, just prior of the entry into force, which was a Wednesday. So we are still uh, reading a lot of things that were published during those days. But at the end the day uh, we do I do believe that there's a lot of room for uh, for, for us as, as practitioners and also for our clients to get a lot of benefits to try to have a more uh, integrated supply chain within the region that will lead us to uh, to, to have some uh, competitive advantage against Asia and of course some of the countries in Europe so uh, in Mexico, uh, pretty much uh, the, the key th uh, changes that will impact the operation, of course, would be the automotive uh, industry. Uh, most of the discussion during the U.S., uh, during the NAFTA renegotiation that uh, at the end of the day ultimately lead to the uh, uh, to entering into the USMCA was, of course, this uh, big chunk of, uh, of investment that was uh, uh, at the end, they targeted by the U.S. government. Just for everyone's benefit, in the last 10 years, uh, a lot of OEMs came into Mexico. They built their own uh, manufacturing facilities, and the investment that we received was, ballpark speaking, around $25 billion. So not a lot of, uh, of that investment, of course, did not or it was, wasn't uh, received in, in the U.S., and not of the... Um, most most of the uh, of the OEMs did not build any uh, manufacturing facilities over the past ten years in the U.S. or Canada because they took advantage of some of the lower wages in Mexico for they to be able to uh, manufacture goods. So one of the key targets that the U.S. Uh, trade representative had and that is published on the on, on the. A document that was delivered to President Trump regarding the effects of the U of the USMCA in, in the economy of of the United States. It's that right now they are targeting to have at least uh, 34 billion in new automotive investments in the U.S. So in Mexico, we're not foreseeing that we will have any OEMs that will come to Mexico at least in the in the next five years. But we will uh, that opens uh, an, uh, a key opportunity for Mexico because a lot of the tier one and tier two automotive suppliers will come 
uh, to Mexico and they will reshore from either Asia or Europe to be able to deliver some goods to the U.S. So that is one of the of of the top legal issues that legal issues that we're facing right now. That we do believe that at least for the five next years will bring a lot of uh, billable hours and also uh, questions from the clients. The second part, of course, that is a huge concern that we currently have is that. As you have uh, probably uh, saw on the news right now, our president, it's uh, kind of spending a lot of money. He's to, uh, on, a, on the left side of, of, of the equation here. And of course, he's a populist and he is uh, just giving away money to a lot of people. He's uh, uh, granting scholarships to, uh, to, to the kids. He's uh, trying to create a program where a lot of the of the young people can be an apprentice and they are paid by the government but without having a, a real target or a real focus so of course the mexican government is in the need of having additional resources so they have been uh, starting a quest if you may say so on uh, assessing tax liabilities to big corporations and also they are trying to pressure a lot of the companies for day two uh, pay uh, whatever old duties they, that they do have or, or or taxes on, or if they are challenging uh, some of the resolutions issued by the Mexican tax, tax authorities, they are trying to pressure as much as they can for they to come to a settlement. So over the past probably two or three, uh, or three months, there have been uh, huge cases that has, uh, have been settled by the, by the Mexican government. The most famous right now would be Walmart. Walmart paid around uh, eight, uh, eight billion in, in Mexican pesos, of course. FEMSA, which is the largest bo uh, Coca-Cola uh, uh, bottler in Mexico and that they do own convenience stores like uh, OXO, which is like our Mexican 7-Eleven, which is all about Latin America. Also, they enter into a huge settlement uh, before the government. Uh, uh, mining, so right now, some mining companies, some consumer good companies, they are also the target of, of, of the Mexican government for they to expedite these tax settlements. So th this is one of the other main concerns that we do have currently uh, in the Mexican legal market because instead of giving the opportunity for the companies to challenge any tax resolution through the appropriate uh, uh, jurisdictional courts or whatever, they right now, they're simply trying to push as much as they can, trying to start criminal charges against either the shareholders or some of the officers of corporations to try to corner them and, uh, and settle uh, these tax cases uh, as quickly as they can. So it, it has been effective, although uh, in our opinion, it's not that though all of those companies, they did owe taxes. So this has been quite challenging in, 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 in the past months. And a lot of companies, of course, of course, they are being kind of reluctant on entering into any type of uh, aggressive tax planning, if you might say so, because they are afraid that the company might come after them for, of, for trying to, to do this type of, of strategies. We are uh, uh, supportive in accordance with the law. So this is one of the other things that needs uh, for everyone to, to, to pay, need to be, to, to be uh, reviewed. And of course, it's one of the biggest concerns that we currently have. Also, one of the other top legal issues that we currently have, it's the labor reform that happened uh, probably two years ago in Mexico and that has been deployed over the past uh, year and a half. And especially with the entry into force of the USMCA, uh, Mexico needs to speed up a lot of the of the reforms required in accordance with the uh, with with whatever we committed in the in the USMCA. So, uh, pretty much uh, some of the things that are currently happening in Mexico, it's the collective bargaining agreements. They need to be public. They need to be uh, at the end. They refresh with the uh, in accordance with the new regulations. That will bring some type of friction between unions in uh, in Mexico. So it's something that uh, everyone should be looking uh, looking at. Also, with the entry into force of the USMCA, there are uh, new procedures that if, for example, a supplier, a union, a, a union or a worker says that he feels or that 
that his uh, collective uh, rights were uh, at the end of the day threatened, he can file a complaint before the U.S. or Canada, and they have uh, they have the capabilities of starting uh, a, a quick review process in which some of the USMCA privileges, like having preferential duty treatment or uh, exp or or limiting export capabilities of a company, might be, uh, might uh, be into force if some of these labor issues are not solved quickly. So that's also something that, that has been uh, keeping uh, everyone's busy during the past months, and especially because some of the, uh, I, I do practice trade and customs. So labor, of course, it's not part of, of my expertise, but with the USMCA right now, a lot of clients are demanding that we do provide this type of advice. So we have been commingling with our labor practice to provide a, a whole package service for, to review what will be the impacts at, at some point if uh, these requirements are not met. So um, that would be kind of uh, the third uh, biggest concern that we currently have. And finally, uh, one of the other legal issues that we're currently facing, it's the Mexico's uh, Ministry of, of, uh, of Energy and Resources. They have uh, limited with new guidelines that were published recently, the access for the private uh, sector to uh, participate in, in the renewable energy sector. So they have been reluctant on uh, either granting new licenses or uh, keeping their, uh, the, 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 the contracts that, that were signed in the past. So right now this has been uh, stopped uh, by the Supreme Court in Mexico, but still, the Mexican government is not that eager for the for for, for private companies to enter or in, into the electric sector. They want to strengthen our uh, electric uh, public company. So this has been quite challenging, of course, also during the during the past months, which of course it's not good for foreign investment in Mexico. So the, the, at the end of the day. Uh, I would say that those are at this point the top legal issues that need to be need to be monitored. And if at some point you do have any clients that uh, they do want to uh, invest in Mexico or that currently they do have investments in Mexico, just to oversee these the, these key factors: how the the USMCA will impact their current operations, in case they do have any tax liability assessed by the authorities, just to verify if they are not getting any type of pressure for they to settle. Uh, of course, uh, the impacts that they might have with the labor reform to verify if their unions are fully recognized in accordance with the re labor regulations. And finally, if you have any clients and uh, engage in the, in the electric sector or the renewables energy sector, so they might be having a hard time right now because of these new guidelines that were published uh, recently. Uh, okay, so those are the top legal issues that, that, that we see in Mexico. What are the key threats that, that, that I see uh, regarding the operation of our firms and of course uh, of our clients? First of all, like in the rest of the world, the lockdown. It's hitting working capital. Uh, the sourcing uh, has uh, been having delays. And of course, the sales on, on a lot of the products have been uh, lower uh, on a monthly basis. Right? Just this week, the Mexican uh, Convenience Store Association published their, uh, their figures for the last semester, and the sales dropped probably 20 to 23%. So that's huge, even though that especially during lockdown, you do buy a lot of groceries and things like that. So that's something to be concerned. Of course, in Mexico, different from the U.S., where uh, where there was published uh, a critical sector of critical infrastructure sector, uh, and you were, you were allowed to continue operating in Mexico, we limited a lot of the sectors that were allowed to continue working during lockdown. And that, uh, of course, stopped a lot of the of the industries in Mexico. For example, automotive was shut down for at least three months. So the sales dropped dramatically in Mexico. And of course, our exports either from uh, 
uh, auto parts and also from uh, Finnish uh, vehicles uh, were uh, or uh, they lowered uh, probably up to 90 percent at the uh, at this point. So that was kind of kind of hard for our industries. And right now, recently, we are reopening to the world, but still, as I was uh, hearing some of the comments prior of uh, of going live today and. Uh, Things in Mexico are not getting better. Of course, we're getting a, a lot of new uh, cases of COVID-19 on a daily basis. So this uh, also this has been uh, quite challenging and has been impacting uh, the businesses a lot, and especially because this uh, lack of coordination between the federal, local, and state governments uh, in enabling or allowing uh, the companies to start production again. One of the other key threats that we currently have in Mexico, and as I was mentioning, the federal government, it's spending a lot of money that they do not have. And of course, they're uh, downsizing a lot of the bureaucratic structure of the government. So this is not, uh, uh, at the end of the day, may uh, or, or they didn't have a complete plan they only started firing some of the officers so this has uh, brought some uh, uh, complications in uh, all of the interactions that we do have with the federal government first of all it's of course uh, any licenses that you might apply or uh, uh, permits or any type of authorization of course is getting a delay because the the government has less workforce and of course aside COVID-19, they have been delaying or uh, taking more time to process everything that it's filed before them. So at this point, it's one of the key challenges that we have, especially when we're receiving new investments or companies that they do want to have a, a specific authorization, for example, the maquiladora, which is a very common uh, uh, operational setup in Mexico in which you are allowed to import on a temporary basis goods. So we have been facing delays that uh, didn't happen in the past. Right now it's getting better, but still over the past months, that was something that uh, stressed a lot of the legal environment in Mexico. What other key threats do, 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 do we see for Mexico, especially M&A? Right now, a lot of companies as everywhere in the world uh, as they are downsizing, they're uh, having less sales, and of course, they're getting impact, uh, impacted by the, by the lockdown. Uh, might be target for bigger corporations to get, uh, for they to be acquired, which is not a bad thing, but especially uh, because of the threshold uh, for the competition, uh, com uh, competition Commission in Mexico, that might allow that a lot of the new takeovers or hostile takeovers might happen without having the need of filing these uh, pre-merger notices before, before the competition authority. So at some point, uh, some of, uh, of the companies might be an easy target for other corporations. And uh, one of the other things that it's not uh, related to the legal environment per se is that next year we will have in Mexico a midterm election. So right now, the political scenario has been uh, kind of... Uh, uh, of hot at, the, at this point. So uh, we have two sides, of course, the, the, the government officials and, uh, and the president and his party and everyone else, because right now they, are tr they do have a complete uh, different vision on how things should be conducted. Right now, uh, the president has a, a majority in both chambers. So uh, uh, the opposition is trying to uh, be very proactive and trying for next year uh, for they to be able to have more presence in both chambers to try to stop some of these reforms that has been uh, have been proposed by, by the federal government. So uh, at the end of the day, and that will also impact the business environment in Mexico. But of course, not everything is bad. Mexico is still a great place uh, to invest, and we do have a lot of uh, uh, of good things to offer to the world. So we do see some key opportunities for the near future. First of all, it's the automotive integration through the region. As I was mentioning earlier uh, uh, on the call, uh, due to the USMCA entry into force, uh, a lot of companies will need to uh, reconfigure their sourcing uh, within the uh, within these three, uh, within our three countries. Sorry, so we do expect that a lot of the production that, as I was mentioning, that currently is uh, carried out either in Asia or in Europe will be brought into Mexico, the USA, or, or Canada, and that of course will integrate more the supply chain. Uh, 
uh, this is a, a huge market, as I was mentioning, just uh, it's targeted by the USTR that the, the investments in OEMs, as I was mentioning, it's 34 billion. That should also trigger uh, 76,000 uh, jobs in the US and for Mexico, uh, probably 30,000 jobs within the next five years. So it's a very interesting time just to uh, be close to the automotive sector. Be, uh, uh, and especially because these uh, new requirements on the, on the rules of origin will require more production in our three, uh, in the three countries of North America. So it's, it, it, it would be uh, a good opportunity just to, to stay close to, to this part. Also, um, Mexico will expand the, its uh, free trade capabilities with Brazil regarding the automotive sector. I know that we're having some discussions with Argentina. Maximo will probably speak a little bit more of that later, but that will bring also a key opportunity to have a regional hub, in, at least for, for Mexico, in which you will have OEM uh, suppliers or, or tier one or tier two that are from all the regions and will be located in Mexico and will be able to produce either for the North American region or for Latin America in general. Also, one of the other opportunities that we do see is that with the tariffs imposed by the US to China, there are a lot of companies that are rethinking about their supply chain. So we are seeing a lot of nearshoring and reshoring of the operations that on the past were moved either from the US or China or, or Mexico to China. They're coming back because uh, of course, they do want to take advantage of the preferential duty, duty, duty rates of the USMCA. And also they want to take advantage of the other FTA agreements that Mexico has entered on in the past. We are the, uh, one of the countries that has mo uh, more, uh, the most of, of uh, benefits with, uh, with other countries. We do have 14 FTAs entered uh, up to date. And especially last year when we entered the CPTPP, we do have access to a different market that was not under the radar in Mexico. So that's something that also would be interesting uh, for us as practitioners because a lot of companies will come to our region and they uh, will require either legal services or will require analysis from, uh, from all of us. And especially what we have seen over the past three or four years is that companies that come back to, uh, to Mexico or that they want to, re, uh, to nearshore they want a one-stop shop solution. So uh, we will need to change the mindset in which we offer legal services to our clients and try to deliver a solution in which we could provide a soft landing, uh, one-stop shop uh, uh, offering of services uh, and that we can create some synergies with either uh, park developers or uh, companies that they do specialize on relocating uh, either expats or things like that for us to be able to deliver one single service and tell them, if you come with me, I can uh, structure everything that you need for your business for you to start from day one. And in Mexico, uh, I, I do believe that that would be some of the, of, of the key services that we will be rendering in the near in the near future. Also, one of the other opportunities that the COVID-19 uh, brought to us is that a lot of companies in, uh, first of all, because they wanted to keep production and not be shut down, they reconfigured their production lines. And right now, a lot of companies that were in different business are manufacturing personal protective equipment right now. And uh, uh, either we like it or not, we're facing a new reality, a new normal, and we will require to use face masks, to use gloves, or things like that, that at least for the next two or three years in our work centers. So a lot of companies right now, they are investing and uh, switching productions to manufacture this type of goods, with, which we also see a good opportunity for, for the coming future. And finally, uh, in Mexico, as I was uh, mentioning, the president has his own agenda. He's very narrow in the things that he is proposing. And he has three top initiatives at this point. First of all, it's the new airport. Uh, if you heard some of the news, we were building a new, uh, we were building a new airport in Mexico. Prior of he entering the office, he made like uh, a poll in which the, 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 the people decided not to continue with the construction of that airport. 
uh, that was really unfortunate. But right now they're building a new airport for Mexico City. So there are there is room for companies to act as suppliers for the government for that particular project. Also, there's the Dos Bocas refinery in, in Mexico, which is in the south of Mexico. Uh, this is a new refinery. It's uh, targeted to be completed within three years. So also regarding the oil and gas uh, industry, there is room for being a supplier of the government. They have a lot of money to spend because they want to finish fast this project. So it's a good opportunity also to uh, to bring this type of uh, of, uh, of suppliers uh, to Mexico. And finally, uh, in the southeast, um, there's a new initiative that is the Mayan uh, Railroad, which will be all over the, the Yucatan Peninsula. If you have had a chance to go to Merida or to Cancun, this will be uh, a more intended for, for a railroad intended for tourism. And of course, there's room for construction companies, for uh, railroad suppliers to have a big piece of, uh, of, uh, of business entering into those three uh, key projects that currently the Mexico government has. Uh, that's uh, as far as uh, of key opportunities. And finally, the future of trade and foreign investment in Mexico. How do I see it? First of all, it's uh, because of the lockdown, because of COVID-19, all of the countries saw that you cannot stick with uh, to a single partner in terms of trade. So Mexico right now is trying to uh, create a policy to expand the FTA uh, utilization that I was mentioning earlier. So if we do have a lot of countries that we can enter into, for, uh, into foreign trade, let's just try to divest our exports because right now uh, we are exporting almost 80% of our, of our total uh, exports to the US. So uh, we're targeting to, to, to have a more divested market in the, in the short future and to, of course to open new markets also one of the other uh, things that i do see that will happen as i was mentioning it's the rebalancing of, of all the supply chains uh, sourcing everything from asia will no longer be an option so we will be seeing more near shoring uh, and uh, not uh, precisely in Mexico, because a lot of the industries will come back to the U.S., to Mexico, Central America, South America are also good options for for a deeper integration. So we, so uh, I do believe that we will we will see a, a, a dramatic change in the in the rebalancing of the supply chain. Just uh, to give you an example, uh, right now there's an uh, an e-congress of supply chain which is held with, with professionals all over the world. So these three days there have been. Uh, Say, uh, uh, having lectures about how do they see that the supply chain will be reconfigured for the next four or five years. And everyone agrees that we will no longer be seeing uh, uh, offshoring uh, uh, product, uh, supply chain structures. More, we will be more uh, we will be seeing more regional supply chain solutions for uh, at least uh, for, for for the consolidated industries. And finally, one of the things that was not fully deployed nor integrated in our culture as Mexicans, it's the ECOM. With the COVID-19, uh, the ECOM process and, and the tropica tropicalization of the, of the ECOM practice in Mexico uh, uh, speed up a, a lot. So uh, right now we do see that uh, all the e-com platforms in Mexico, they are uh, expanding their storage capabilities. They are opening DCs all over the all over the the country. So the e-com e business will uh, be growing more and more over uh, in in the next probably five or six years. Just uh, to give you an example, the the retail stores in Mexico they do, uh, have seen. Uh, over the past three or four, uh, three or four months, that their sales decrease probably 30, 40 percent, and the sales on the ecom, in accordance with the latest reports that were published last month, the the sales in ecom uh, increase about 56 percent. So, either Amazon, Mercado Libre in the region that is from Argentina, of course, and all of these uh, platforms, they have been, uh, of course, uh, preparing uh, themselves to 
uh, be able to uh, to deliver the goods more quickly. Right now, of course, also the, the courier services in Mexico, they have been expanding. They have been also acquiring more land or leasing more land to have bigger distribution centers. Unfortunately, uh, in this particular piece, Mexico at the end of the, uh, at the, uh, at the beginning of the year, sorry, they author, uh, they uh, implemented a tax uh, on digital services, including the e-com. So right now it became enforced on, on June the 1st. So the downsides of, this, of it is that although the business is growing right now, uh, they are paying bigger taxes and also the end, the end user is paying more taxes because right now BAT uh, and uh, special withholding on, on income tax for the seller, it's being applied to, to the sales on income. So let's hope that that doesn't prevent the, the growth that has been happening. So I hope that uh, I didn't bother you. Uh, 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 was uh, speaking so fast, but this is pretty much the legal perspective that we do have in Mexico uh, uh, and that we uh, see as a firm and also what we have seen in accordance with uh, the things that we have uh, been uh, serving our clients with over the past months. Well, thank you. Thank you, Roberto. That was extremely interesting and um, really timely information. So uh, just to keep things moving, um, I want to um, move on to the next speaker and then we'll come back and, and talk about any of these things that people have questions about. So our next speaker is Alejandra Bernal. Uh, Alejandra is a partner with CRF Rojas in La Paz in Bolivia. So Alejandra, I am turning it over to you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for having me. Um, I will be giving you a legal overview for Bolivia, and I will start off with a digital signature. Um, as in other countries, the COVID-19 pandemic and the strict quarantine ordered by the Bolivian government restricting mobility have drastically affected the Bolivian um, companies. One of the processes that have been most difficult in Bolivia due to this situation is the operational part of the companies, which involves the signing of any type of contracts. Although um, until now, most of the companies in Bolivia continue to implement their contracts in person, we consider that the COVID pan pandemic has forced us to advance on the issue of digital signatures, electronic contracts, as well as the online processing of permits and registrations for, uh, of companies, which were only carried out in person before the COVID pandemic. Um, the, the telecom law number 164 provides the legality of electronic contracts, electronic and digital signatures. In accordance with our current reg regulation, the following uses are established for a digital certificate. First, any legal act or business carried out by a natural or legal entity in a digital document and accepted by the parties by means of a digital signature held by electronic means. Second, the electronic data message. And third, the digital signature. Um, the same regulation exempts the use of the digital signature for the following acts. Um, the first one, the acts proper to family law. Uh, second, the acts in which the law requires the personal appearance of any of the parties. And uh, third, the legal acts um, or businesses provided under law that for their validity or enforcement require a physical document agreed by the parties. Now, as you are aware, the digital signature is a technological tool that ensures the origin of a digital document or message and verifies that its content has not been altered. Um, it is mandatory for a digital certificate to be issued by an authorized certifying entity, which responds to international recognized formats and standards. In Bolivia, there are currently two entities authorized to issue digital signature certificates. The first entity is called ADSIP, which responds to the telecom regulator. ATSIP is a public entity for technological services designated as the only public authorized certifying entity in charge of um, is um, issuing digital signature certificates. Also, there is a private company named DigiCert, which was born out of the need to provide digital services for secure technological environment and to also uh, contribute to the development of the electronic government and encourage the use of technology in the business environment, uh, thus providing, uh, promoting development of companies. 
So as features of the digital signature, we can point out the validation of the identity of the holder of the digital uh, signature. It also authenticates the ownership of the digital signature. It links the dig a digital document or electronic data message with a digital signature and the person. And it guarantees integrity of the digital document or ele ele electronic message. Um, the benefits of these features First, the most important, security, time and travel savings. It does not require physical presence and a, a paperless policy that reduces the environmental impact. And it also allows to carry out procedures at any time and in digital form, and as well as saving in messaging and physical files. Um, for all the uh, aforementioned, the, the use of the digital signature is recommended since it has a much higher level of security than the electronic signature, but it requires a previous certification where in a simple process, uh, the biometric data of the signer is validated and it is assigned a digital certificate. So it, 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 it is recommended to use it in the following cases. Uh, first, we recommend it to use it in contracts with significant amounts or that are macro agreements for the relationship with a counterparty. For example, distribution agreements and agreements with um, uh, major suppliers. Second, in recurring contracts or contracts with the same parties, since these parties could go through the process of certifying your digital signature, it would not be a problem to use it repeatedly. For example, contracts with clients where authorizations or consents have to be provided constantly. And third, to close agreements with parties located abroad. However, um, this type of transaction must be analyzed on a case-by-case -case basis because its usefulness may vary depending on the country and which entity certifies a digital signature abroad. Now, it is important um, to point out the difference between the electronic signature and the digital signature. First, um, I must explain each concept. The electronic contracts or e-contracts are all those digital representations of acts, facts, or data, regardless of the means used to fix, store, or display them, which can be used to implement any type of transaction permitted by law. An e-contract can be formed, for example, via email or through the exchange of electronic documents. And on the other hand, the digital signature is one that it is electronic represented by means that allow the owner to be uh, identified and that links the data of the document and the signatory in such a way that any modification of these uh, can evidence their, their alteration. The signer must have a digital certificate from the, the digital signature certifying entity, and the digital signature is used to validate the document to determine its authenticity and that it has not been altered. This plays a fundamental role in verifying the identity of the author or signatory of the document. Uh, this type of doc, um, signature has a high security and is used as evidence in, at trial. And finally, the electronic signature is an electronic symbol, process, or sound associated with a registration or a contract. In other words, the electronic signature can come in a format as simple as accepting a document with a click or an electronic version of a signature by hand. Um, in Bolivian regulations, classify any signature in electronic format that does not have a digital certificate as an, electri an, an electronic signature. Uh, taken together, these electronic means of contracting provide the businesses with low cost, immediate and secure way to execute contracts. In this context, although electronic contracts are useful for all cases permitted by law, there are certain cases where it may be more useful to use the electronic signature and in other cases, the digital one. Um, as mentioned, all these digital contracting means are valid under Bolivian regulations and may be used as evidence at trial. However, certain care must be taken for each part of digital contracting according to the following. First, the, for electronic contracts, 
if your company will use co electronic contracts as a daily part of its operations, it is advisable to think about the drafting, signing, and filing of these contracts as part of a system and that it be revised by legal counsel in addition to technicians. In order for each stage of the contract uh, can be guaranteed in case of issue resulting um, from fraud or any wrongdoing. Uh, second, the digital signature is a completely secure mechanism for signing uh, contracts. It is important to obtain the digital signature certificate from an authorized certification entity. And finally, the electronic signature where Bolivian regulations uh, allow this signature to be used as evidence at trial. In this sense, it is recommended that the implementation and filing of this type of signature be a, a, um, uh, filed with uh, information that will denote the identity of the signed signatory, his express consent to the document. Third, uh, to associate his consent to a specific text, for example, the terms and conditions. And fourth, any other evidence that the person voluntarily participated in this transaction. It is also recommended to keep a file of the different interactions within the same transaction. The, co the continuity of actions helps to prove the consent of the parties towards the conditions of the transaction. As I mentioned previously, uh, the process to obtain a certificate for the digital signature is quite simple. Uh, for a natural per person, you only need a national or a foreign identification document and the latest utility bill. And for a legal entity, you need a national and foreign identification document, original authorization from a legal entity signed by the legal representative and documents showing the tax identification number. Um, the process for register for obtaining a digital sig uh, digital signature certificate is is very simple. You only have to log in to the web page, um, register uh, as a user in the register button, log in, create a new request, choose a certificate profile if you are a natural person or a legal entity, upload the requirements according to the certificate profile. You have to also upload your photograph, generate a key pair, and pay for online services, um, which uh, are really low cost in Bolivia because a, it has an annual fee for a natural person for only $11, and for a legal entity, it's $23, and this is for the whole year. So it's pretty low cost. Once uh, the digital signature certificate has been secured, um, the company will require a cryptographic device, a digital sin signature uh, program, and the document can be in the, docu the, the document that will be signed. And with that, you can issue the digital signed document. Um, that is something, something new in Bolivia. Well, it's not new. It's actually been um, regulated um, for about seven years now, but it's it's now being implemented due to the pandemic. So, well, now moving on to intellectual property. Um, as known, since March 11th, when the World Health Organization declared uh, the world pandemic situation, and March 22nd, when Bolivia entered a strict quarantine as a result of COVID, um, our lives, our daily routine, both personally and professionally, have suffered an interruption, which has also had a high impact on the world, both um, humanly and economically. Um, although we have had to stop work in our companies completely or partially due to COVID, I consider that trademarks in these last three months have gone through positive changes and have acquired greater recognition and value for companies. Companies around the world and in Bolivia are currently in a situation of constant change and with the effect that COVID has had on our daily lives and professional activities. Um, in these difficult moments, companies through their trademarks had to seek more than ever to have a complete vision of the reality we are all going through and always work one step ahead. So it is extremely important, important to the companies to have uh, a predictive analysis team that can help improve reaction capacity and be prepared to lead decision-making based on the current situation. 
Uh, the brands with most public recognition in their reaction have been those that have been uh, adapted to the conversations that the, the consumers were already promoting and that have found the point of union with their purpose to be relevant in, in the in market. This pandemic situation has shown that um, the citizens in general look at brands as a pillar of stability in, in the most difficult moments in search of comfort or security that they do not always have uh, find at other times. So that uh, those brands that reinforce the feeling of calm or well-being will generate more positive emotional ties. Um, COVID issues have generated a deep crisis for both our country and our companies. So in addition to the uh, what I said before, companies have had to make a call for conscious uh, consumption, and this was only obtained through recommendations or calls to make purchases online from local businesses with extra emphasis on the Bolivian industry. It, it is for all this that trademarks and the entire process that revolves around trademarks both in production and final delivery to the consumer are extremely important, important for the success of our companies during this pandemic, since the consumer wants to be informed. And for this reason is that companies must always be one step ahead. Uh, having a predictive analysis team of the constant changes that may occur with the trademarks in the production of the products that contain the brands or the services that the company offers this team must take into account the, import, the importance of protecting their intellectual property rights, and this is only obtained by registering uh, their trademarks. Since with quarantine, the information that we receive through social media not only reaches our clients or consumers, but it also uh, reaches wrongdoers that will try to take advantage by registering third-party brands, either to obtain an economic benefit or to take advantage of the fame that the company has obtained through a lot of um, human work and also economic investment. The good news in this case for Bolivia is that despite being in quarantine and, un and unable to mobilize normally, is that the Bolivian Trademark Office on April 20th uh, issued an administrative resolution, number 013-2020, uh, through which it resolves to authorize the reception of applications for registrations of trademarks, patents, uh, name changes, address, assignments, mergers, and also renewals of trademarks through their website. Uh, first, the applicant can file their application through the BTO virtual platform under the condition of filing the physical documentation within five business days. Uh, the user must log on to the BTO's webpage and fill out the corresponding form, either to apply for registration of a trademark or patent, uh, renewal of, a, of the application. When this form is completed, the user must scan all the documents and require for filing an application according to decision 486 of the NDM Pact and the specific regulations from the BTO. Uh, the user um, has to send scanned copies of the applications and documentation to the BTO's email address based on the applicant's jurisdiction in Bolivia. And once the documentation is filed, the BTO will record the filing of the application and must verify compliance with the presentation of the requirements established by law. Uh, if the BTO confirms that the information submitted by the user meets the requirements, the BTO will confirm payment of the official fees. And if the verification is satisfactory, the financial administrative uh, director of the BTO will certify uh, the information by email so that the technician receiving the application continues with the admission of the application. Um, for which purpose uh, he will uh, um, issue an, appro an approval and verification form and which will be automatically generated. Uh, this approval and verification of compliance requirement form will be immediately sent to the user through their, the email registered with the BTO. And as I said, upon ad admission of the, uh, by the BTO, the applicant must formalize their application within five business days. 
filing the supporting physical documentation, and if uh, failing to comply with these terms will result in the application being considered non-filed in accordance with the BTO rules. So this is pretty much it. Thank you very much. And we will be happy to assist with your client's needs in Bolivia. Thank you, Alejandra. Thanks for the detailed and, and useful information for those of us who have clients doing business in Bolivia. So um, let's continue our trip south and um, arrive in Argentina. Uh, Maximo Richard for, um, is going to tell us what's going on in the legal market in Argentina. Um, uh, Maximo is a partner with Becar Varela, who's our member there in Buenos Aires. Maximo, you have the floor. Okay, thank you, uh, Larry. Uh, greetings, everybody. And um, thank you for inviting us to this, pro to this program. I will be presenting the Argentina overview, and I would like to uh, focus this presentation on some legal matters that are deriving from two current issues uh, that have become intertwined. Um, these are the pre-existing uh, national economic crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, well, since new administration took over last December, a battery of measures have been passed uh, to fight an overall state of national crisis uh, on this matter. Uh, statute number 27501 has declared uh, economic, financial, tax, administrative, energetic, sanitary, and social national crisis. So it pretty much affects every sector of, 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 our, of our country. And uh, the government response to this situation was to adapt uh, a, a policy of favor towards uh, internal commerce over uh, foreign trade. Um, since last December, uh, we have seen a downfall in both exports and imports. Uh, precisely $1.6 billion uh, worth of exports, representing about 25% uh, of the overall volume, and uh, $0.8 billion, representing about 18% of the overall volume for imports. Uh, so these numbers, I think, clearly reflects uh, the policy adopted by, by the government previous to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and from a legal standpoint, uh, this, uh, this policy has been materialized in three uh, primary measures, which are an increase in the tax pressure, both on import and export operations, an increase in the restrictions to access the foreign exchange market, and also a tightening of uh, the administrative barriers uh, over foreign commerce uh, through no non-automatic licenses. Uh, regarding uh, tax pressure, uh, well, the commented uh, statute 27541 uh, has increased the applicable statistics fee uh, for definitive import operations from 2.5% to 3% and has also uh, limited, uh, increased the, the, the limits applicable to export operations uh, from 30% to 33% of the tax base. Um, on fourth, uh, the decree number 3719, which regulates this, this uh, statute uh, and was uh, executed uh, uh, to address the economic crisis our finances are undergoing, aims to change the additional uh, export duty regime that was introduced uh, on actually on 2012, but is now established by uh, decree 793 of 2018. And, and removes some of the applicable limits on the applicable uh, export duty. The previous regime established an, a 12% additional export duty that had a limit uh, that consisted of a fixed exchange rate at um, four or three pesos to a dollar. Uh, the, this, this regime applied to a selected uh, universe of tariff positions. Now the, the, the new decree has removed the four pesos to a dollar uh, limit 
and so the full 12% additional export duty, duty has become applicable. Uh, in a similar manner, Decree 99 of 19 uh, has uh, implemented a 5% export duty on the export of services. Uh, previous, the previous regime uh, consisted of a 12% export duty, but with all, also with a fixed uh, exchange rate of four pesos to a dollar. So in practice, uh, this uh, removal of this fixed exchange rate uh, has substantially increased the the export, the applicable export duty. As a comparative example, uh, an export of one dollar uh, uh, worth of services uh, with the previous regime would pay uh, around half a peso of export duty, and with the current regime would pay four pesos export duties. Uh, if you uh, Take that to the 12% applicable uh, to to uh, additional exports uh, export duties uh, of goods, then the, the the result is a lot more higher. Um, so these changes should be added to a general tax ecosystem that contemplates uh, about six uh, duties or taxes applicable for import operations and. Three uh, exports, uh, three duties, and taxes applicable to export operations. Um, other, some particular goods uh, have uh, more internal taxes applicable, but this is the general regime. Uh, specifically, uh, we have the following uh, duties and taxes for imports. We have the import duties per se. Uh, that can be either uh, specific or ad valorem. The, the, the former is a fixed figure and the latter is uh, the, the most common of, of both and consists of a percentage that is uh, applicable over the CIF value of the, of the good and can, be, can amount up to 35% uh, of the CIF value. Uh, also, uh, it's applicable uh, VAT and the added VAT tax uh, to every definitive import uh, operation uh, and can amount to 21% and 20% respectively of the CIF value of the goods plus the uh, applicable import duty. Uh, also, we, we have an income tax applicable that can amount to 11% uh, of the CIF value of the goods and the applicable import duties. Uh, a gross income tax that can amount to 2.5% of the CIF value of the goods with the applicable import duties, and the statistics fee that is applicable for both import and export operations, uh, which have, was increased by the commented uh, statute uh, number 27501, uh, that it was increased to 3% of the CIF value of the goods and 2.5% of the tax base of the goods for export operations. Uh, on the export side, uh, the export duties per se, uh, that can also be specific or, or at the lower uh, being the, 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 the latter most commonly applied, uh, was increased to 33%, and the additional export duties commented before um, that are now of a full 12% applicable over the tax base of the goods. Uh, in overall, we have a uh, total tax pressure uh, on imports of 115% of the CIF value of the goods and of about 48% uh, uh, for export uh, operations. Um, so, uh, so much for, for tax pressure uh, moving to the restrictions over foreign exchange on May 2020. Uh, our central bank, that is the entity in charge of controlling the foreign exchange, uh, issued uh, two communications, uh, communication A7030 and A7001, that regulate the access to the foreign exchange market uh, on four accounts, um, the, on freely available funds and access to the FX market, uh, to the foreign exchange market in general, um, uh, for the payments of imports and commercial indebtedness, uh, for financial indebtedness and for, for transactions with security. 
regarding uh, the access to the foreign exchange market uh, financial institutions must request their clients that they submit an affidavit uh, stating that they have no foreign currency holdings deposited uh, outside uh, i'm sorry they, that they have all their foreign currency holdings deposited in local financial institutions so they must not have any foreign uh, currency outside the bas ban banking system. This includes safety, safety security boxes. Um, also, that they have no foreign liquid assets. They, they have uh, coined this term uh, to define uh, cash in foreign currency, uh, gold uh, on demand deposited, uh, deposits on foreign financial institutions and other investments that allow for immediate liquidity. And finally, they must uh, include a plea to transfer into Argentina and to convert to pesos any funds received abroad arising from loans, uh, term deposits and sales of any type of assets that were granted, constitute or acquired after uh, the, the, the entry into effect of these two communications on May 28. Um, there are a few exceptions applicable. Uh, there is a limit of a uh, total of $100,000 worth of uh, available foreign liquid assets that uh, can be used without restriction. And also, uh, you can access the foreign exchange market if on the same day you request uh, access to the foreign exchange market, you fully use your available foreign liquid ac assets. So in short, uh, all, your, all, uh, the, the, all the foreign available liquid assets must be uh, used before accessing the foreign exchange market. Um, Regarding payment of imports and commercial indebtedness, uh, also uh, an affidavit must be uh, must be submitted uh, declaring that the total amount of payments uh, association with imports uh, during the current year is d does not exceed the amount that would have been applicable uh, if every import conducted on this importer's behalf was recorded on the SEPA info system. This is the system that the, the central bank uses to track uh, import payments. Uh, this includes cancellation of la lines of credit and commercial warranties. Uh, and the exceptions are on medicinal products and payments of imports that have not yet been cleared by customs, as long as the total amount uh, of, of payment spending clears, clearance does not uh, exceed one million in general or three million dollars for medicinal products. Um, to 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 re regarding offshore financial indebtedness with uh, related counter counterparties, uh, it's needed a prior uh, central bank approval uh, in order to cancel principal payments, uh, not interest payments, uh, as long as the lender is a related party. Um, finally, with transactions with the securities. Uh, the uh, restriction period was established, so financial institution must require an affidavit to customers in all foreign exchange sale transactions that they have no, not sold securities with settlements in foreign currency in the previous uh, 90 days uh, to the transaction, or in the or, or nor they will do it in the 90 days after the transaction. Uh, this does not apply to operations carried out by the financial institution themselves or to the cancellation uh, of uh, financing in foreign currency when the finan financing body are lo local entities or when natural uh, persons are transferring uh, uh, the, 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 the money abroad when beneficiaries, when these persons are beneficiaries of pensions provided by the local social security services. Um, uh, then uh, there was uh, an implementation of an administrative bar barrier to, to foreign trade operations uh, through non-automatic import licenses. Uh, these are uh, licenses that must be re requested 
uh, previous to to being authorized to, to procure an, an import operation. Uh, though this uh, mechanism was implemented in 2017, uh, on January 9, 2020, uh, the Secretariat of Knowledge, Economic, Industry and Foreign Trade issued Resolution 1-2020, which amends the import license regime and adds uh, 300 uh, around 300 tar tariff uh, codes to the scope of products that are subject to these non-automatic import licenses. And it also modifies the uh, process uh, of request and approval of these non-automatic import licenses uh, in a way that applications must now, can, cannot be now uh, filed uh, incomplete. Uh, all the requested information must be fulfilled before the, the application is filed and uh, the previous regime allowed for a 10 business day period uh, where an incomplete application could be fulfilled and finally it reduced uh, both uh, the tolerance of FOB values and quantities declared from 7% to 5% uh, between what is actually declared and, and what is later uh, imported and also it reduced the validity term uh, of the of the licenses from 180 days to 90 days period. Um, moreover, after uh, the implementation of these measures, uh, the administration, the, the government has uh, taken a more active administration of the foreign commerce using a great deal of discretion to reject and delay the approval um, of these non-automatic import licenses. So this has been also a problem for a lot of our clients in the past months. Um, regarding key threats, uh, we have identified three quick key threats that are the intensity of customs scrutiny over foreign trade, uh, the implementation of reference values in export evaluation, matters and the an overabundance of customs infractions uh, with the risk of goods being detained. Um, from our previous previous experience, uh, triangular operations have been usually performed as a strategic way to avoid issues that we have previously, previously de described in this presentation. Uh, this Operations usually involve a succession of sales where a uh, third party intermediate is involved in a way that uh, the exporter builds the third party and then the third party builds the importer. Um, while this uh, practice is specifically accepted uh, worldwide, um, in fact, the Technical Committee of Customs Evaluation in their commentary number 22.1 has uh, approved this practice and actually clarified that uh, in, in cases of succession of sales, uh, the last sale is to be considered to, uh, to constitute the transaction value. Uh, our customs uh, frowns upon the, the practice and consider is, consider is it uh, generally, generally suspicious. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, it conducts a very intense scrutiny of, uh, of operations, especially when the importer and the exporter are based in bordering countries, because they can uh, verify through a system in Lira, which is a system that allows for bordering country customs to, to communicate be, between each other. They can verify the documented uh, customs, the documented values before uh, the, the two countries' customs. And if they perceive a difference between the exported uh, value declared and the imported documented value, they will automatically observe the operation. Um, this observation can either end in a value investigation or a value adjust adjustment or uh, more often uh, an indictment for an inaccurate declaration in, in the terms of section 954 of our customs code. This uh, poses an issue for importers uh, and exporters because uh, these observations may entail a delay in the operation and also they, they come with an over cost that, uh, that is uh, to justify the documented value before customs. Um, on the 
export side of the equation uh, recently through resolution 4710-20. Uh, the our national administration of public revenue has implemented reference values uh, for export goods valuation um, and through this mechanism through this technique they aim to protect uh, the fiscal revenue and to modify the selectivity system for value appraisal matters on export goods adding a primary control over export value through these uh, precautionary reference values. Uh, the resolution itself uh, only instructs customs to, to implement these reference values and it established that any definitive uh, export operation where the documented values deviate from these re reference values that, are, that, that have to be established in any way uh, will uh, imply the the allocation of uh, the channel of verification red value, which is, that is the most intense uh, verification channel applicable for value. Um, so when the documented value is inferior than the, than the referential value, then this channel verification will be, uh, this channel verification uh, red value allocation will be mandatory. And if the documented value is superior to the to the reference value, then, then it will be optional for customs to allocate this channel. Uh, with this mechanism of, con of allocation, also every other cost of allocation of this channel still apply, uh, notwithstanding the, the, the value deviate from the reference value or not. Um, the allocation of this channel does not necessarily imply a value adjustment. Uh, because these reference value are not a valid uh, element to reject the transaction value as the primary means to produce the tax base of the exported goods according to a customs code. So they only uh, serve to make an analysis of uh, the export dispatch in an electronic manner uh, through the computer. It does not imply also the detention of the goods nor the detention of the operation, uh, but it can lead to an, to an acceptance and, uh, or a rejection of the documented value or a value investigation that will lead again to this uh, acceptance or rejection of, of the value. Uh, well, the, the, the point in, in this uh, export uh, reference value is that this technique is not either efficient uh, nor effective to to control the, the values of, of the exported goods, uh, first of all, because it's it almost all the time requires a secondary check of check over the the documented value, and this is because the the reference values are inaccurate and most uh, in almost every case uh, they are outdated. Uh, in first place, because they do not contemplate all the elements that constitute the tax base, uh, such as the time and place of the of the export operation, the included expenses in the export operation, such as the internal freight, the commercial level, all the discounts applicable in the in the commercial operation, and because the modification and elimination process uh, of these reference values uh, lack the agility to keep up with the dynamic reality of the international prices. Uh, it, they involve the participation of several customs departments and other government area, areas as well as private parties. Uh, and they also require several instances of, of discussion uh, between these parties so that they, they, they take a, a very long time to be established, to be modified uh, and to be eliminated. Uh, as a matter of fact, they have been implemented over uh, a month and a half ago and still we have not uh, seen established not one reference value. Uh, well, this, this situation describes uh, a general policy of very strict scrutiny over, uh, uh, over import and export operations which leads to an overabundance of customs infraction because uh, there is a very high risk uh, of detection of infractions and 
uh, also because uh, customs Asian agents have a natural tendency and a natural inclination to observe and indict operations uh, in order to avoid disciplinary observations on their behalf. Uh, so this kind of creates a, a vicious circle where they continually uh, indict uh, operations and they, they get continued continuously overflowed uh, by customs indictment and then overload by work and so they uh, start the, 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 the circle once again. Uh, this is an, an issue for importer and exporters because uh, it, it, the indictments have an additional risk of the detention of the goods by customs and also because uh, because of the cost of litigation be before customs. Uh, Although a successful defense is very often uh, easily to present when the documented values uh, reflect uh, the, in import operations, the amounts paid or payable, and in export operations, they accurately reflect the tax, pay, the, the tax base, uh, the, the, the defense is pretty successful, but it does have a no, an over cost of the operation that needs to be considered. Um, so, so far, uh, it's quite an, maybe an, a negative uh, uh, frame for uh, Argentina's foreign trade, uh, but there are some key opportunities to be presented because an unexpected advantage of the, of the intense control over the foreign exchange market is the unfolding of the foreign exchange. Uh, the, 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 right now we have um, two foreign exchange markets, one formal uh, foreign exchange market that is controlled by the central bank and an informal and regulated by the, the, the central bank market. Uh, and they do have a, a, a quite big spread in the difference of the exchange rate. The formal uh, market has an exchange rate of 75 pesos to $1 and the informal uh, market has an exchange rate of 127 pesos or so to $1, so, so, so the spread is pretty big. This allows to uh, importers and exporters to perform import and export operations uh, that provide access to the foreign exchange market at a reduced uh, price in pesos, which allows to purchase goods uh, at, a lower, at a lower cost and also uh, uh, allows to sell the, go the goods in the internal market at a very competitive price. Uh, in previous experience uh, with this kind of uh, regulations and situations, we see a lot of cases of sales storing um, because of this uh, because of this possibility to to access uh, to the foreign exchange market at a reduced price, such as uh, as the cost uh, uh, as the case of luxury cars in 2014, there was a very big spur of sales in luxury cars. Um, with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic in force right now, and the country in car quarantine, our economy is uh, is is very low right now, and so these cases have not yet uh, arised. Uh, but when the quarantine is withdrawn, we do expect some of these opportunities to present themselves, especially in those sectors where there is uh, no local competition and so imports uh, are not as protected, the, the national industry is not as protected from imports as it would be uh, in other sectors of the industry. Uh, at that, that can also be an opportunity uh, uh, if you bear in, uh, in mind the effect that the COVID-19 pandemic will have on our economy and a, a lot of uh, industries uh, closing down, uh, this, this will present probably a lot of opportunities for investment uh, in imports and export operations. So, well, th this was our presentation and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, Maximo. Um, to open the floor to anybody who may have questions about uh, for any of the speakers about any of the topics. Yeah, th th this is this is Arnie Lutzker, and um, first I want to thank you. I mean, uh, th the presentations were extraordinarily detailed and useful. For
particularly for those in the field. And one thing I'd suggest is if you have any written material to send it to us, in addition to presenting the, the recording online, we can incorporate any written material on the website that um, can identify you and the firm and sort of the substance of what you've been presenting, because I think that, you know, that, that would be very helpful. There, there's such detail, it, you know, it, it's, it's easy to, you know, to lose sight of it, but we, if we have multiple sources of, of materials, it would be helpful. Roberto, I want to just, just uh, sort of, this is an aside comment, I've got a separate question, but um, everybody's been attending a lot of Zoom um, uh, sessions and meetings and whatever. The, your room that you are in with your cars and figures and everything is one of the most uh, captivating <laughs> portions uh, of, uh, of a background that I've, that I've seen anywhere. And so I just commend you. I'm sure there's a lot of stories that you've got about what's behind you and on the side, but um, you know, we, we can save that for, for another day, but I just wanted to commend you about that. One, one issue that I, I want to sort of pose, it, it touches on Alejandro's, uh, Alejandro's um, trademark issue, but it also Im implicates trade generally. And Larry, you may also have a view. Um, in the United States, I'm in Washington, D.C., there has been this intense effort by the um, Native American tribes to have the name of the Washington football team changed. I don't know if this is world news, if you follow this, but the Washington Redskins are ending their name and they're gonna adopt a new name. They haven't adopted it yet because they've got trademark issues associated with this. But it sparks to my mind, and one of the things we've done, and um, my partner wife, Susan, has, has done some writing on this, and I'm particularly interested for Latin America, the, the import, is Native American uh, societies that are in each of your countries um, have claims to symbols, words, phrases, imagery that implicates their culture, society, and themselves. And this, I think, is going to become a much more significant issue over the course of the coming years highlighted in Washington by the changing of, of this particular name. But um, the, the question goes to whether from a trademark and a branding and an import export point of view, the, the, the words, phrases, names associated with native uh, indigenous people to your home countries has become a significant issue, whether it impacts uh, trade, prevents trade, whether it allows for registration of trademarks or prohibits them, and sort of what, what, is, the, what is the import of that? And it may be a topic that we can, on, a, on an IMBLF cross-border basis, um, provide more uh, robust discussion about. I, you know, it, it may be too complicated a question to sort of deal with, you know, maybe the little time that we have remaining, but, but just to sort of initiate the discussion and then maybe create a, um, a, an internal discussion within, within the network and the group about that issue. Yeah, well, actually, in Bolivia, um, Decision 486 of the Indian Pact uh, prohibits any uh, registration on uh, native uh, um, uh, tribes or uh, symbols or flags. Uh, they are not allowed. So, for example, uh, if um, a trademark uh, similar to Redskins were uh, to be registered in Bolivia, but oriented to a Bolivian tribe, um, the Bolivian Trademark Office would not accept the registration. They would deny it. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, uh, we don't have that type of problems like uh, you are having in the U.S. with the Redskins uh, because they simply, they just don't, they do not allow it. Our regulations do not allow it. But one, one of the issues related to that was there was a situation similar in Australia where a symbols of um, Australian uh, aboriginals 
were discovered in Poland in connection with carpeting in a hotel. And it, that became an issue sort of exporting. And, and it, it sort of is the, um, the, the issues associated with, you know, a, the worldwide commerce and communications. I don't know um, if between uh, uh, Argentina and Mexico, if there's any, um, if, if this is a, of current discussion uh, in your countries. Well, uh, in the case of Mexico, there is no provision that prevents you, like, like in the case of Bolivia. As a matter of fact, in Mexico, one of the top selling brands of one uh, of Heineken in Mexico, which was a Mexican uh, uh, part, part of the portfolio of the Mexican brewery that Heineken acquired five or six years ago, it's in uh, Cerveza India, which is Indian beer. So it's one of the top selling brands in Mexico. We do not have an issue uh, for using that type of brand. As a matter of fact, uh, I don't know if I can share, or you can just Google the logo, it's Indio. And uh, no one feels discriminated or that they are uh, kind of uh, uh, attacking their, their ancestry or something like that. It's simply a brand. So. It's particular in, tra in trademark in Mexico, there's no, no provision that prevents that. Of, and of course, uh, we do have other brands in Mexico that, that make reference to either the tribes or there's a, 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 bra a brand in Mexico also that it's uh, that they have used a lot of the Aztec symbols for 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 their clothing and. Uh, they can. They are allowed to register them, and no one has m make a big deal of it. So, sorry. Uh, likewise, in Argentina, um, it's really not an issue here. Uh, we do have some brands that uh, refer to some indigenous uh, population. Uh, for instance, the Mapuche brand, and it's really not not an issue. Uh, so. We don't know of, of any cases or any troubles uh, similar to the Redskins case in, in Washington. Uh, here, it's really not a problem. So I'll just say for folks who may not know, in, in the U.S., and Arnie, you know a lot more about trademark law than I do, but marks that are scandalous are not allowed to be trademarked. So that's sort of a moving scale depending on, on time. Um, but there was a Supreme Court case recently on um, for a, a band, a rock band, that had a, a, a name that people thought was an Asian American um, um, slur. So uh, although it was, I guess, debatable, and eventually the Supreme Court found that they could uh, trademark the name uh, basically on First Amendment grounds. On the trade side, there's not a lot of restrictions for branding. There are um, restrictions on um, the importation of articles that look like Native American jewelry that are not Native American jewelry. They can be imported, but they have to be labeled in a particular way to identify them as, as not being Native American turquoise. Um, that's an unusual um, regulation. Then there's also um, the US is um, party to the um, convention involving the movement of cultural property, um, which is not necessarily, again, for branding issues, but it does involve the restrictions on the movement of, of, of artifacts and items that are linked specifically to a, um, uh, a particular culture, a particular um, 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 ethnographic or, or historical perspective. So, there are some restrictions trade-wise, but the issue you're raising, Arnie, is a um, is a interesting and important bigger question. And I, I will say, Arnie, before you jumped on, I did give Susan a plug for her her really good article on the Australian uh, Aboriginal art and uh, environment case. Um, so it was, it was a, a nice article. So, any other questions before we wrap up? I want to be mindful of everybody's time. Sure, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Larry, and uh, to all the colleagues uh, in this meeting. Uh, I wanted to say something in Spanish, and I'll say it in English. Quería saludar a todos mis colegas de México, de Bolivia y de Argentina. Eh, aquí tienes un colega en New York City, 
y ojalá podamos hacer algo juntos en el futuro eh, a través de IMBLF. What I said to my colleagues was, uh, it was great to be able to speak Spanish with some fellow <laughs> members from our great organization and uh, thanking them for the work and, and suggesting that at some appropriate time in the future, we should collaborate together uh, and do something like this, like a Latin America uh, forum through IMBLF in Spanish uh, and obviously open it up to everybody and maybe have some English component. Anyways, so putting that aside, my, my core expertise, my firm's core expertise here in New York City, uh, based in New York City, is uh, tax, and we do a lot of international tax. So I really appreciate hearing some of the tax comments, uh, particularly from Roberto and, uh, and Maximo as well. Very brief question to, to my colleague Roberto. Uh, you mentioned that Mexico is jumping on the, jump, uh, on the, on the bandwagon with respect to digital taxation, obviously a very hot topic in Europe and here in the U.S. and other jurisdictions. Uh, maybe this is too technical. If not, we could discuss uh, some other time. With respect to how Mexico is attempting to tax digital goods, digital income, uh, we know that it would be probably either through, through a gross receipts type of base or through a net income base or some combination. Roberto, do you happen to know uh, broad strokes, how Mexico is, is, uh, is purporting to, to establish the sourcing for that, right? Because the sourcing could be, for instance, where the customers are, of those digital goods, or where the income producing activities underlying those digital goods, or where the brain power is for the company. There's different ways of doing it. So I'll give the floor to you and uh, thank you all once again. Yeah, of course. Uh, in the Mexican case, in the way that the digital tax was structured, it's that, uh, of course, it's a consumer base and all foreign companies that they do provide digital services, Airbnb, uh, Zoom, uh, Amazon, whatever, they need to register before the Mexican IRS and you need to appoint a legal representative. So in that way, you will need to have the monthly reporting, all the services rendered through the platform, and that's how they will collect either the VAT or the withholding uh, income tax for the uh, local businesses that use their platforms. Pretty much is how is it structured. We, I do believe that we did prepare some type of uh, 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 of e newsletter from the firm. I can share it to you. Just shoot me an email, and I will uh, circulate uh, through the group. Terrific. Thank you again. Thank you. And Roberta, Roberta, that's something we could also circulate more generally too uh, within the network if you want. And, yeah, perfect. And, and to follow up on, on one of the thoughts I've had sort of on a longer term basis would be to establish like we have in Asia and Europe, a Latin American summit. Uh, this, will, this will be a post COVID activity, but uh, to, to have us get together um, on a periodic basis in Latin America, uh, I think um, you know the, the, the more the more IMBLF members can visit and associate uh, in Latin America, I, th I think it would be fabulous. So uh, we can also set up a networking, um, also Zoom for um, Latin America, and include um, different members from the United States that are interested in or have clients that are interested in doing business in Latin America. So that's something to look forward to the future, so. Yeah, Marcin, I wanna, I wanna uh, second that because again, we don't know when COVID is gonna change. It's all speculation from my point of view. And, and yeah, you should definitely look forward to the future when we do something in person and make it a great success for everybody and for the organization. Uh, but maybe doing like Marcin said, some, some intermittent Zoom or some other other platforms, whatever, uh, and do a Latin American forum. Just make it a few hours to not overwhelm people, but to kind of just get us going with it and exchanging ideas, tax, trade, and so on and so forth. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you to everybody for participating. Appreciate all of your time and attention. And thanks again to, to our speakers. And we look forward to seeing everybody on the next Great Legal Minds webinar.